So in 2012, just after the election, Alyssa and I went to dinner with Matt and Hillary, got into this great discussion, and Hillary says, John, why, why are your people so afraid right now? And I said, well, it's, it's because I, I, we're, we're seemingly losing a place of dominance in our culture and so there's kind of this grabbing for power and it got me thinking you know about the early church and so I said are you guys aware of the early church and what happened there and Matt goes oh yeah man absolutely you know they actually followed Jesus you know they were living underneath this dominant oppressive persecuting government and they were just going for it and people wanted to be like them and it grew like crazy I said, are you, are you familiar with Christendom at all? And Hillary goes, oh, absolutely, Christendom. That's where Constantine took the church, married it with the state in Rome, and that whole thing really took the teeth right out of the tiger, John. Yeah, I mean, they, it did. Like, they, it, it like blew the roof. It changed everything for hundreds of years. So since episode one came out, We've been in conversation with a lot of leaders. They, they drive to the church every single week and they're like, I love God's house. I love the people here. I love what we're doing. But it's making this huge assumption that oh, the world outside of this church is going to come here to hear the message that we're delivering in this place. And that works. And it is working in churches that can attract attractable people but the fastest growing religious demographic in America right now are people who are not attractable to a church and so that causes us now to go okay how are we going to export the good news of Jesus to the world from here And I've personally become pretty fascinated with the way that the pre-Christendom church, the early Christians, that's what we call them, the early Christians, the church that existed in the first, second, and third centuries after Jesus, how they thrived in the way of Jesus in a culture that hated them. Most scholars would say, uh, probably in the first hundred years of Christianity, you're looking at around 25,000 people. But in the next 200 years, that 25,000 has become about 20 million. And think about it, they did it without buildings. They did it without professionalized clergy. They didn't have Bibles in their hands. Now let's think about that. And the guys weren't running around with scrolls either. So they were committed to retain what they heard. So the apostles teaching that weekly gathering that they would gather, people were absorbing it. Okay, I mean, they were taking it in and then they had to add their life to it and live it out. Well, when they did that, you go from 25,000 to 20 million, you know, which is exponential crazy numbers. The remarkable thing about the pre-Christendom church experience is that it was literally a dynamic, organic movement of ordinary, often, well, always unprofessional, but often not even very well educated people who just decided that they would live out what the reign of God looked like. They're feeding the hungry, they're taking the sick into their homes. I mean, they literally transformed Roman society, not by holding the best worship services. It was like they outloved society. It was like salt and light. I don't know where they got that idea from. Uh, literally, they transformed it organically and societally. Why? Because they were seeking to live out the values of the reign of God. And the early church prior to Constantine was a marginal phenomenon. It was in the margins, underground, persecuted, illegal. What he did is he took them and made them right at the center of society and um, fundamentally changed the nature we, how we saw ourselves but also how we stood in relationship to the context that we were in. Effectively, almost overnight, became a reduction of 
the faith community as a, 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 a missional and organic and relational infiltrating community within society, it became almost overnight a professionalised conduct of religious goods and services that Christians were meant to partake of, really, rather than participate in. There were, there were great shifts made after the Reformation, but really the essential crucible in which worship occurred wasn't renegotiated. It was a Sunday gathering and only professional people could conduct it. So it seems that those of us in the church in the USA have inherited certain things from Christendom, even though we have this technical separation of church and state, we still operate in modes that were established in European Christendom. What we're arguing for today is that we put the work of the church back in the hands of ordinary men and women, that we raise up people in the ability to make disciples that live on mission together in this culture that is seemingly beginning to grow more and more irritated with us by the minute. The issue of whether Christendom has now come to a conclusion, a finality within Western culture is a hotly debated subject. What I mean by Christendom is the understanding of the world where the church has taken the central place within society and culture and therefore defines and orientates that society around the issues and principles of the Christian gospel. I believe both the church and those related institutions have now moved from the center of the stage and are progressively moving to the edge of our culture. This is what we see the future of Christianity as being. Mm -hmm. Not a re-imposition of Christian dominance, but rather a re-exploration of what it means to know and follow Jesus uh, in surprising ways, in ways that open up new possibilities, unconventional ways. Yeah. So, I mean, if Christendom crumbles, uh, we know people who think this is absolutely terrible and we're quite relaxed about it. The assumptions can't remain. The assumptions that the church is at the center of all we do cannot remain. I think this is an opportunity to pioneer. I do. I think it's an opportunity for us to look at the day we're in and say, what, what do we need to do and how do we need to be and how do we need to function so that we can get the gospel to as many people as possible? I mean, this is where the real energy of, of Christian yeah. life is. Mm -hmm. It's when people really take Jesus seriously. I think what I'm fighting for, even as a worship leader, and as a church leader, as a person, is just proper respiratory function, you know? I mean, even as our breathing, even we've been breathing through this whole thing, we've just been inhaling and exhaling. So when we're thinking about it in terms of the life of the church, you know, whatever happens on Sunday, we're inhaling the life of God, right? As we leave that place, we're exhaling the life of God into the world. But I don't know if you've ever tried this, and maybe we could even try this right now. If all we do is inhale, I mean, just try it. Just try it with your body. Just <laughs> try to keep in it. You, you'll die. If all you do is inhale, you'll die. And I think that that is a metaphor that is appropriate for much of the modern church right now. There's something in our souls. There's a dissonance in our soul right now that is, I think, a craving that's telling us what we have is good but we need to mature and grow into something more. And if we could trust kind of this hunger in us and begin to pursue something new and value it and say that thing that we're wanting to pursue is legit, right? It's not born out of cynicism. It's not rebellious or whatever. There is a real craving in a generation to sit at a table that feels like family, where they can you know, radically love God, radically love one another, and then they just exhale missional zeal. We want that. We want that so much. And I think we can trust that longing.